we need to do, um, it's, one thing, it's one thing for me to explain this stuff to you, and it's one thing for you to understand it, and then go memorize it. And we're tempted to think that when we have done that, when I've explained it, and you've understood it, and you've gone to memorize it, that we've completed the task, right? But in fact, that's only the beginning. That's only in the initial stages. What has to happen after you've understood it and memorized it, you kind of have to work it in. You know, it's kind of like, it's, it's kind of like oiling a piece of fine furniture. And so you, you gotta, you gotta just rub that oil in to the wood, right? Well, I guess in the analogy, the wood would be your brain. I don't know if that, <laughs> but anyway, um, you, <laughs> you know, there, there, there takes a process of, of working these things in and, and you uh, gaining experience with these concepts, right? And we talked about you need to forget these things several times before you really have it. And you need to gain experience. So there, there are a couple of ways that we can gain experience. We can gain experience by, um, you know, working through all of the things that the grammar has to offer us for our experience book, right? We could concentrate a lot more on the, um, going through the exercises and things like that, and concentrate more even on examples and stuff like that, right? And that would be good. Or we can gain experience and, and work things in by going to the biblical text. Now, the advantage of being in the grammar is that we're working in the right stuff at the right time, um, which is good. The advantage of being in the biblical text is that's where we want to be, right? Um, to me, at least 50% of my job as a beginning Greek teacher, at least half of my job is to motivate you. To motivate you to put the, the time and work into it, and really to motivate you to, to carry on after this class. Now, that part of my job is easy with you because you all are pretty highly motivated. But if half of my job is motivation, what, what's going to motivate you more than us getting into the Greek text of the New Testament as a way of working that in? So, you know, it's clumsy. Money. Huh? Money could motivate, <laughs> yes. <Yeah. laughs> they should do it. If they charged you twice as much tuition and then gave you half of it back if you got an A, that would be good. Yeah. <laughs> You're on to something now. But you know, so that's that's how come I like to spend time in the Greek text because you've got to work it down, you got to work it in, you got to rub it in. Um, I think better to use the Bible um, than the grammar. I mean, we use the grammar as much as we have to, but let's get out of that stinking book and get into the real book. Right? Right? You know what I mean? So your handout for tonight, let's just go over that very quickly so that I know you understand parsing. We know that for parsing, we have our tense, voice, mood, person, number, vocabulary, and meaning. So there are seven parts to a typical parsing. Now, a participle is going to have an extra part, because we don't have person and number, we have gender, number, and case. An infinitive is going to have two fewer parts, because we don't have anything in the person, number, or gender, number, case column. But a finite verb is going to have seven parts to the parsing. What is tense? Well, tense is how you feel after a quiz. No, tense is um, the kind of action, and secondarily, time of action in the indicative mood. We've talked about that. We understand that. All right, tense. All right what is voice? Voice relates the action of the verb to the subject. Active, middle, or passive. If the subject is doing the action, it's active. If the subject is acted upon, it's passive. So, uh, I ran over a box. Active. Uh, I was run over by a truck. <laughs> uh, passive. I ran over myself. I ran over myself is silly and middle. That's right. <laughs> That's right. So, um, in the middle voice, 
Um, there are various meanings of the middle and various ways to translate it, but in, you can understand the middle voice by understanding that the subject is somehow more involved in the action than just a regular actor. Right? Like you said, I ran over myself. I, I hit myself. Or, or even, um, I made the bed. I, uh, the bed was made, passive. Or, I had the bed made, middle. I didn't even do it, a maid did it, but I had it done, right? Um, so I, I, I'm involved in the action in some way that is different than active or passive. And deponents, we know, like uh, the deponent for what, for example, peri patet, oh, well, that's, that's not deponent in the, in, the, uh, in the vocabulary form. Well, how about I come, I go, air come on, there's a deponent. Um, Right? So you can see, by its very nature, by that vocabulary word, um, I come, I go, air come I, right? If I'm coming, I'm somehow more involved in that action. In fact, it's almost an active and a passive, right? Because who's making me go? Me. But who's getting there? Me. So I'm also, I, I'm, I'm really at the same time the initiator of the action and the receiver of the action. So, um, I think you can make an argument for most opponents that they actually truly are middles, but we give them an active translation. So an opponent is something with a middle form and an active translation. We don't say, I walk myself. That sounds like you have a leech on you. You, hold it, right? you say, I walk. All right, so that's voice. Mood relates the action of the verb to reality. So. The indicative is the mood of actuality. And there are potential moods. The imperative, that's the mood of command, right? So if I say, hey, shut the door. Has the door been shut? Well, not necessarily. I'm not saying the door is shut. I'm issuing a command to shut the door. So if there is an action, shut, it'll happen in the future. Same thing, I might shut the door. If there's an action, it'll be in the future. Uh, optative, well, I might possibly shut the door. That will also be in the future. So actual moves, potential moves. Then person shows the relationship of the subject to the speakers or hearers. Uh, in the first person, the speaker is the subject. In the second person, the hearer is the subject. In the third person, neither the speaker nor the hearer is the subject. Okay. I, you, he. Number relates to the subject as singular or plural. Of course, the vocabulary form is generally the present active indicative, first person singular, and the meaning, of course, is the English translation. So you understand all about parsing verbs and tense and kind of action. Okay, um, 25, vocabulary. Say the vocabulary right after me. A lay face. A lay face. True. Now, LA face, LA fess, um, what kind of word is that? Noun. No. Nope. Um, adjective. Adjective. How do you know? Because of the text. True. Okay, because true is an adjective. All right. Um, what declension do you think that adjective is in? Third. Third declension. Right. All right. Um, now, what's going on with that? A lay face, a lay fess. Is that found in genitive? Well, no. That is, now what, what do we normally get with adjectives? Masculine, feminine, neuter. Okay, we can normally get masculine, feminine, neuter with adjectives, right? What do we get here? Well, we get masculine, feminine, and neuter, but the masculine and feminine are the same form. Oh. What we have here is what is called a two-termination adjective. That's pretty fancy, isn't it? That's cool. A two-termination adjective. What's a termination? <laughs> An ending. Very good. And there are two, where well, there are normally three. Now, you know, I mean, if you separate all the numbers and cases and everything, there's more than that. But in terms of gender, uh, there are normally three, right? Masculine feminine, neuter, but in this case, the masculine and feminine are the same, so you have masculine, feminine, and neuter. That's what's happening here. All right, 
Uh, Archiarus. Archiarus. Okay, that's chief priest. Archiarus, Archiareos. Now, what's happening there? Ha. Huh. What kind of word is that? That's a noun. You're given the article. So we have the vocabulary form, and that's in the nominative, masculine, nominative, singular, right? Uh, well, masculine in this case, because nouns are going to be one of three, right? Um, so, but that is masculine, not a singular. You're given the um, vocabulary form, and then you're given the article last. What comes in between? Genitive. The genitive form. What does that tell you? Third declension. Third declension. So our adjective is a third declension adjective. So sorry there are those. Um, and the noun is a third declension noun. All right, very good. Um, asthenes. Okay, there's another uh, adjective like a lay phase. <coughs> Basileus basileos. King. Genos. Genus. 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 Race, stock, people, descendants, kind. Uh, grammatus. Grammatus. Grammateos. Grammateos. Scribe. So you can see we're getting a different kind of third declension noun here, aren't we? Right? Because they look different. Uh, all right? Dunamis. 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 Very good. Now that's power or strength, miracle. All right? Ethnos. Ethnus. Ethnos. Ethnus. Now that one could get you because that looks like a masculine. Uh, it's neuter. It, it uh, looks like it's going to decline after the second declension, but it doesn't. The genitive is us, which is kind of exciting. Mm -hmm. All right? That means uh, the nation. Gentiles. Um, hierus, hiereos. Hierus, hiereos. Priest. Now that makes sense if Archiarus is chief priest. You see how that works, right? And then uh, hiereus is priest. All right. Chrysis, chryseos. Chrysis, chryseos. Judgment. Judgment is a crisis, isn't it? Uh, oros, orus. Oros, orus. Mountain. Pistis, pisteos. Pistis, pisteos. Faith, trust, belief. Um, play race. Play race. Play race. All right, there's another adjective, just like a lay face. Full. Uh, polis. Polis. Paleos. Paleos. City and telos, telus. Telos, telus. All right. More third declension noun times. Isn't that great? Third declension was introduced in Lesson 17. You may wish to review the basic endings and special characteristics of this declension. What are the basic endings? Sigma, os, it, a, s, on, c, os. Very good. Sigma, os, it, a, s, on, c, os. You can see, however, that these third declension nouns are not following that, are they? Different stuff. Now, remember the day I gave you that sheet about the third declension? And you thought, well, that's my stuff that's just unnecessary. Right? Well, it was at that point, but it's not anymore. All right, so feminine nouns in is, etos. The declension of polis, poleos, is as follows. On the paragraph below that, it says the stem of polis is poli. Well, if you have that little handout that I gave you, it's now time to dig it out. Okay, remember all of this happy stuff? Basically, the two boxes up at the top, or the one box kind of divided up into two parts. You see that up at the top? Yeah. Well, that's kind of a summary of all of this. So it means there are a few exceptions to it, but that, that basically gets you going. We've looked at consonants and upsilon stems now. Uh, at least the endings for those, right? So we know sigma os it a s on c os and blank os it blank a on c a for the neuter, right? Well, now we're looking at iota and epsilon, upsilon, and sigma stems. Now, 
these, all of these categories are broken out separately to give you the distinct endings down below. So what are the consonant stem endings? There they are. What are the upsilon stem endings? There they are. Now there's a difference in the upsilon stem endings. You'll notice in the accusative singular, instead of being alpha, it's nu, right? So if you have an upsilon stem ending, it'll have a nu in the accusative down there. Okay, now the um, Yoda stem endings uh, go like this. The dash shows you the separation between the stem and the ending, all right? So you have paulis, pauleos, paule, paulin. And if this is correct, that should be what's on the page in the grammar. And it is. Okay, so do you see that? And the plural, uh, paules, pauleon, paulesi, paulit, paules. So here we have sigma os e nu, is on si is for ending. Which is pretty exciting, isn't it? And so that's why polis is formed the way it is formed. Now, this is this is why you like to have the article with the third declension noun. Because if the article is with the third declension noun, it kind of removes the doubt of what you're dealing with. Because it's easy for us to deal with the article. Nonetheless, if we get a little bit familiar with these things, <coughs> it's not too hard. If we've remembered polis, as vocabulary and paleos as vocabulary, then we get two down anyway, right? Pale, that looks for all the world a lot like a dative singular because it has an iota in it, doesn't it? Without a sigma. Look at the dative plural, it still has an iota in it, but with a sigma. So that's characteristic, right? Os, u, o, iota subscript, on, or a, Os, a, yoda subscript, on, dative, characteristic of the dative forms is always yoda subscript, and sigma in the plural, right? I own ice, os, oi own voice, us. So you pick up some patterns for the, for the dative. It's got an iota, and in the plural there's a sigma, and s in plural is not too hard for English speaking people to remember, right? Um, and the new characteristic of the accusative, you can see. So, you know, if you relax, it's one of those relaxation moments. If you relax, if there's no article, you can look at the context, you can make a pretty good guess, at least, right? Or you can just memorize this whole sheet, have it cold if you want. Uh, I would suggest you try to just go on a recognition basis. Um, so, we come over here to the, um, the noun basalus, king. Um, what kind of stem do you think basalus is? It's an epsilon upsilon stem. It's different than an upsilon stem. All right, and we see that in the right hand, hand bar. So these endings are going to be basically sigma os e a is on si is, right? Uh, and that kind of fits what we have here. But if you want to look at the epsilon, upsilon stem endings by themselves, very accurately, they're by themselves, uh, right down kind of on the left-hand side of the page toward the middle. You see that? That's exactly what the endings look like. Um, in the nominative singular, we have an epsilon, upsilon ending the stem. In the rest of them, we have an epsilon ending the stem, except in the data plural. See that? And that explains why you have the forms and endings you have in the book. All right, now neuter nouns in os, if we come down here, the stem of genos is what? Genes, so what stem are we dealing with here? Sigma stems, right, so that would be the right hand part of that box to, at the top, right, the sigma stems, all right, but if you want the sigma stems just by themselves, very accurately, here you have uh, on the right hand side, starting at the middle of the page and working down to the bottom. Masculine, feminine nouns and adjectives, same ending, that's kind of nice. Um, but notice this note to the left right there. All of the stems in the third declension avoid contraction. So if you have um, basileos, if that contracted, it would just be basileos, wouldn't it? 
They, they don't contract. They, they almost sound like the vocabulary form of a contract verb, don't they? See? So all of the stems avoid contraction except the sigma stem, which always contracts if possible. So here, when you have the, um, the ending epsilon, uh, omicron, sigma for the genitive singular, see where I'm looking? Instead of eos, it'll be us, because that's going to contract. So sigma stems, masculine, feminine nouns, and adjectives, neuter nouns. So we have a neuter noun in a sigma stem. So here's why we have genos, genus, gene, genos. Can you see how that forms right there? The endings are sigma, os, is sigma, but they contract when they can with the stem, end of the stem. See, the thing about their declensions, remember, is that their stems tend to end in vowels. So we have weird things going on. Okay. Neuter adjectives in the sigma stem follow those endings right at the bottom right hand part of the page. Now here we have our adjective of the third declension. A lay face, see, masculine and feminine, same form. I'm at the bottom of page 152. Masculine and feminine, same form. Neuter, just to the right, and the plural further to the right of that. Okay? So, what you want to do is kind of just, you know, kind of just get, get in the zone with this page a little bit, right? Go over it, look for patterns. Um, realize that there are, you know, there are all kinds of, he's not using these terms in this grammar, you know, grammarians are going to use different terms, they're just describing and they use different terms to describe it, but there are, there are consonant stems, there are upsilon stems, iota stems, epsilon upsilon stems, and sigma stems, there are nouns, there are adjectives, realizing all of that. Um, what are the basic endings? Um, sigma, os, i, a, s, on, c, a, some blank, os, i, blank, a, on, c, a, Fairly characteristic of the declension, but there are pretty major changes at some points, right? So at least if you know those, you know, you're going to go a long ways. If you know those endings, and, you know, the ones you get an article on, you're helped by, so, you know, you're flying by the seat of your pants on some of them, right? Um, but if you, if you get a little familiar with this, if you learn your vocabulary correctly, uh, polis, polepos. That's going to help you a lot, isn't it? Um, you, you shouldn't have too much trouble with them, but they, they're kind of, you know, the third declension nouns are a little like mosquitoes. They're not going to kill you, but they're sure annoying. <laughs> okay, any questions on third declension nouns, adjectives? So why don't you do every third one again on the New Testament in, uh, in those? So for next time, for the homework, you're, you're in these three chapters, you're just doing the New Testament section, and you're just doing every third one. And for the quiz, you are um, memorizing the vocabulary in each one of these chapters, and the subjunctive endings in that one chapter. This will be good. The homework slides, though, are going to be fun to actually learn it. <laughs> yeah, see, there you go. And, and then, the homework is light for that reason, but also for the reason of being able to uh, hang out in our New Testament more. Uh, before we do that, any questions on the grammar and stuff that we have uh, looked at? All right. Well, this is our fifth class period together, if my reckoning is right, which means we have five more to go. So if we're going to finish First John, we have to do it in five lessons. Um, but that's okay, because we're going to finish the grammar in three lessons, nice. in three nights. Yeah. Well, no, look at, the, uh, look at the table of contents. I mean, we're pretty close to the end of it. There are only 32, there are only 32 chapters in the grammar, right? And uh, we have just completed less than 25. So we only have seven more chapters to go. Um, so that only means we're going to do two chapters a night, except one more night, we'll do three. So we'll do two, and we'll actually... We're going to do two and two, and the last night we're going to do three. Um, but what is in the last chapter? Proper names, special uses of the cases, optative mood, the article in various constructions. You don't even have to memorize the optative mood as far as I'm concerned, so be careful. You are going to teach it again. It's exciting, exciting now, huh? Pardon? It's exciting. Well, it is. Because the last two nights we're together, we will do nothing. Read our Bible. So our exam's not going to be in class. 
Um, I think it's a good idea for me to give you a take home exam like you did. You can do it. Bring it back. Now, he told us that the exam that he gave us last time <laughs> was supposed to be for this court. Yeah, so you just did the same exam again. Really? Yeah. <laughs> you did the same exam. Because actually, I, I saved that. a copy. Yeah. <laughs> How do you give your exams? Are you uh, no, no charts, no books, no notes? <laughs> well, I call my um, tests not open book, but open mind. So we get to share minds with each other? <laughs> well, you may. If you, want, if you would like to um, do a test together, you may do that. But it's highly unadvisable, because then you have to share the grade. So if together you get 100, you at least get 50. <laughs> or if there are three of them, you can get like a 33. <laughs> At best. No, not a good thing. You got me all going there. You can see. I'm that guy. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, it's it's going to be. It's just the test is just going to be uh, vocabulary and endings um, that you've been responsible for, and really not having that many endings um, <laughs> since since I started, right? Well, okay. We've had way more since we started. <laughs> okay. In that, in that half well, time that we've had you, we've had way more. Than I'm at such a disadvantage for not having started the beginning because I don't, I don't have a perspective on where you come from. Like <laughs> but just in any case, all right. So vocabulary and endings, and um, we can throw in some parsing. So I might put a verb there and say parse this, and uh, translation. And the translation might come from your exercises that you've done. Um, or it might come from first job. Is there going to be an English degree? No. no. Oh. <laughs> hip hip. <laughs> All right. Hey, 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 hey. Come on. <laughs> now you, it'll just be the, the sentences that we've done at. <laughs> yeah. There'll just be the sentences you've actually been assigned to translate. <laughs> So if you've been if you if I've told you to do odd, then I'm not going to pick number two to put on the test. I'll pick number three maybe. Um, okay, uh, if I remember correctly, you're supposed to um, do as much of first time one five to ten as you can handle. Uh, how many of you finished that? Did you did you get all the way through first John one five to ten? Okay, good. I'm very glad. Uh, okay, uh, who would like to who would like to translate for us uh, from verse five? Well, not from verse five, all of verse five. Okay, go ahead, Stacy. And this is the message which we have heard. Him and we announce to you that God is light and darkness in Him there is not. None. Okay, very good. I like it. Um, look at that word at the end there. Isn't that a great word? Udemia. Can you can you separate that out and tell me what that's from? Three words, right? Ude, right? But Ude is even made of two words, right? Ooh, U yeah. and De. And Lu. And Mia. You haven't had Hase Mia Hen yet? No. Okay, Hase. Now, not Ace with a smooth breathing, but Hase with a rough breathing. Both the same except the breathing mark. Mia Hen. Masculine, feminine, neuter forms of the word one. Right? So there is, um, there is not even one, you could say. So there's no darkness at all. So that's that's very good. Uh, Stacy, what what tense is ake ka amen? That's the uh, perfect. Okay, perfect tense. That's right. How'd you find that out? Mm. You just knew that. Amen. Amen. Okay. We, we it's a first plural. All right. It's a funny form, and the reduplication in this word is kind of in the middle of the word, isn't it? It's pretty odd. How, how did you guys deal with that? How did you find that out? Mm -hmm. 
Yep, yeah, that's part of the spin. Okay, oh man. It's from Akuo, of course. Um, the ending was really Amen, second person of Professor Kappa. Um, I looked at three hundred. Okay. So. I think you did ha I think you did have it. Uh, it's, it. I think you'll find it in one of the lists, either vocabulary or principal parts for a list in the grammar. Uh, I know you've had it in the grammar. What'd you look it up in? Uh, Strong's. Okay. Uh, I, wonder, I wonder if it's in here. Who would like to um, translate number six for us while we're looking at this? I mean, not trans not start yet, but who would like to? Which one did he ask you Well, actually, if you look up Akuo, now you need to know it's from Akuo. Mm -hmm. Actually, if you look up Ake Ka'a, so you could have looked this up in the dictionary in the back of your um, <coughs> grammar, really, and got it, because it says, I have heard perfect of Akuo. That's not going to give you Amen, but it's going to give you A. Ah. So that's Pardon? Pardon? I mean, that's kind of a sister. I think there's a difference. Yes. Well, it does. It kind of does look. It's odd that the reification happens within the stem instead of in the front of the stem. Mm -hmm. But, yeah, okay. Yeah, you may have remembered it or been uh, in your subconscious even for being in the grammar. But well, who's doing the first well, the one thing? following there, the uh, Nagin Laman, that's the Laman is uh, present indicative. Yes, Ana. Yep, Anangela man. Now, two gammas together sound like an NG, don't they? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All these related to the word for angel or messenger, right? Angela, Angelia, message. Anangela man, we announce. All, all sort of cognate words, if you will. All right, uh, go ahead. He's going to stand for six. You're going to do seven? Did you, you want to do seven? Now, you know, I know that it's really difficult to not be jumping up and down in your chair with this stuff. You know, but this subjunctive thing that we have right here, we just learned tonight. Is that exciting? Right. And we also have indirect discourse here in this verse, which we just learned tonight. It is difficult to stay in my seat right now. This is just so exciting. Go ahead. All right. If we might say that we are having Okay, let me stop you there. Um, I like how you get the subjunctive across. It lets me know you know it's subjunctive. But already in English, if we say, if we say, that's already contingent, isn't it, in English? So we don't really need to repeat that uh, because it's already contingent. So, um, you know, you did fine in terms of our purposes here, but, but you know, in the future you can say, if we say. Okay, so go ahead. That's a that's interesting word, pseudonymous. Right? Pseudonymous. Pseudo. Right? Lying. Some of the vocabulary words aren't that hard to remember because of that. <coughs> all right, very good. That's a nice translation. Um, I can see you got the tenses all out there and all of that. And what a powerful you know, verse that is. If we say that we're having fellowship with Him, with God, with Christ, and we're walking in darkness, we are lying and not doing the truth. So we can make all the claims in the world that we are you know, connected with God, but if we're walking in darkness, those claims are meaningless. Right? Now, what does it mean to walk in darkness? That's a great question. Verse 7. Um, <clears throat> but if in the light we may be walking as he is in the light, Okay, very good. Now again, same thing with the may, that if I already mentioned your contingency, huh? I don't have to use that because of if. Because you got the if there. But it's because you have the if, and which if do you have? You don't have a, you have et on. Now if that were a, you might translate it since or because, which would be better. Because in English, if gives me the contingency. 
right? Well, A doesn't have really a contingency. I mean, it's kind of, you know, in between, in a sense. But in some context, it doesn't have any contingency at all in B. So, but we'll go ahead. You don't have to put the A in there. That's, a two, that's awkward anyway. Okay. We are having fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, is cleansing us from all sin. Awesome. Now, did you do that just looking at the text right there? Just now? Yeah. Yeah. That's good. That's, you, guys are, you guys are doing very well. It's very impressive. Now, you're not writing in your Bible, are you? No. Well, I'm not there. I have. It's okay to write in your Bible, but do not write vocabulary and parsing in your Bible. And that's a really, really hard, odd stuff. And if you wrote that, you'd be forgiven for it. But you need forgiveness for writing that. Right? Because you're adding two words. Well, you're creating you're creating a bad crutch if you do that. You know. So so don't. I mean, if you want to write notes like, "Ooh, this is really cool," or something like that, that's fine. But don't don't write vocabulary or parsing into your Bible because that's you know we're not we're trying to live without that. Real tough stuff if you're going to go back, you know, you, you can do that. But that's, you know, you're admitting defeat at that point. And sometimes, you know, we are defeated, and it's okay to admit that, but just know what you're doing, right? But we're supposed to be losers. <coughs> yeah, well, wait a minute. <laughs> no, we're supposed to be in the balance between losing for a living and not being losers. Oh, right? okay. <laughs> you know, I, gotta, I tell you something. I, well, the sermon I preached Sunday was about... Um, being selfish in the right kind of way, you know, and I had to be very careful with that, but, you know, I, I, I'm encouraging people to be selfish, right? I know, see, that's the thing, and, I, and afterwards, I, I didn't hear the end of people, you know, joking with me, especially in the young marriage group, that, you know, they're telling their wives that they had permission to be selfish, and everything. but the idea was the immature are selfish in a self-centered way, but the mature are selfish in a Christ-centered way. Why is that important? Because we, we miss the point of Christianity if we, if we say that to deny myself means to deny myself of all of my drive, and particularly my drive for self-fulfillment. God, his intention in calling me is to fulfill that drive for me. To, for that drive to be fulfilled, I have to deny my, not personal fulfillment, but personal sovereignty. See? And it is when I deny my personal sovereignty that I experience personal fulfillment. You see what I'm saying? Now, Jesus said, he who wishes to save his life or soul, same word, psuche, but he who wishes to save his psuche will lose it, but he who loses his psuche for my sake in the gospel will save it. Right? Um, so there is a sense in which we have to be utterly selfish. Because what's the best thing I can do for myself? What's What's, I I to live my life with, with utter abandonment, utter, utter abandonment toward my own self-interest. And what is to my greatest self-interest? To, to utterly give myself in service to God. Isn't it? As Christians, we don't sacrifice for nothing. We sacrifice for something. What, uh, who was the missionary? that was killed, who said, um, uh, huh? Jim Elliot said, uh, uh, he said, just a second, he said, I give up what I cannot keep to gain what I cannot lose. And both halves of that are very important to understanding Christianity. You can't just say, I'm giving up what I cannot keep. It's not the end of the story. I'm doing that to gain what I can't lose. So the most selfish thing you can do is to serve Christ with all of your effects. The most selfish thing you can do is lose for a living. You know, you think I'm doing that? Um, you know, apart from my own self-interest, I'm losing for a living because that is the best thing I can do from an eternal perspective. Right? Do you think there's too much baggage that goes along with the term like selfish? I know, and I apologize for it several times in my sermon, but I really wanted to make a point because sometimes we view Christianity is as um, deny myself, meaning uh, I am going to. Um, deny my own personal fulfillment. And um, what happens is, um, rather rather than denying fulfillment, what I'm called to do is find my fulfillment in God, right? And if I try to deny my drive for fulfillment, I can't. 
it never will work. And certainly God won't help me, and I will fail. And what will happen is I will find fulfillment in something else other than God, like being self-righteous and proud of my holiness, you know, and go to church with my chest stuck out, which is just as sinful, right? Fair to say. So I got to recognize that I'm at the end of the day I'm in this for myself, you know. Um, I want so it is all about me. And there's a sense in which it is all about, me. and that's and I think that's what Jesus is trying to say. It's all about me, therefore I need to make it all about God. The best thing for me to do, if it's all about me, is to make it all about God. It's kind of almost a paradox, a Christian paradox. Isn't there a danger? You know, I'm thinking of a book Joe Stoll wrote called Her of His Pursuits, which is based on Philippians, in which he warned against an addiction to significance. Because a lot of us are in the ministry, we are addicted to being significant. Right. And it, it sounds like this is coming awfully close awfully close to that. Well, true Christianity is actually very dangerous. I think true Christianity, well, yeah, but what kind of significance do we not want to be addicted to? As a man. Temporal significance. What I want is eternal significance. And I am utterly given in my life to the pursuit of eternal significance. Well, let me turn this around. A servant, in the truest sense of that word, is not thinking of himself. A right. servant is there to make his master the Exactly. That's the best thing for me, though. But that's not turned around. See, that's, that's because God is good. And that's why we have to understand that God is good. God being good means... Is that tape going? God being good means... <laughs> uh, <laughs> I don't like that. Can you? God being good means that <coughs> obedience to Him is also good for us. If God were not good, it might be that obedience to God was actually destructive to us. All I'm saying is, do we not believe that God is good? So if I utterly give myself to God and serve Him, will that not be a benefit to me? And it is... Because God, by nature, is good. Yeah, but your focus isn't on you, it's on God. Right. And here's the thing, here's so the paradox. Wait. If I focus on my personal fulfillment, I will lose it. But if I focus on God, I will end up finding personal fulfillment. Right. So why do That's I focus on God? Because I want personal fulfillment. And I think exactly right. I think if we're addicted to significance in this life, then we've got our reward. I don't want to be addicted to significant for eternity. Now, a couple of the disciples' mother came and asked Jesus, can they sit on your right and on your left? Right? And he said, that's not mine to give. And are they really able to suffer what it's going to take to get to that place? Well, it's not so much I think that it's, it's a wrong thing to want eternal significance, but somebody else can't ask for you, right? And eternal significance is bought by what? You know, deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. So it's, it's a weird, twisted thing that I think Jesus is getting at, <coughs> that... In some sense, our motivation is utterly selfish. But that motivation really needs to make us operate in an utterly selfless kind of way. You see what I mean? It's da I know it's dangerous. And I, I told the church if they didn't listen, I was going to get into big trouble because they were going to get it twisted. Um, I'm reminded of the book by um, uh, John Piper. Um, knowing God? Desiring God. Desiring God. Desiring God. Uh, I'm remembering the subtitle, but it's more significant what I'm saying right now. Uh, Desiring God, Confessions of a Christian Hedonist. And he caught all kinds of criticism um, for using the word hedonist. And you know what? You can almost admit that it's probably not the right word, neither is selfishness. But you're trying to make a point you know, about the nature of things. 
Doesn't the whole significance of the doctrine of eternal rewards come down to that? And yeah. we sort of overlook that, I think, a lot in the, mm -hmm. in the body of Christ. We don't pay too much attention to that. There's clear, clear teaching. Yeah, absolutely. You know, well, and when you know, I was a kid, about 10 years old, why was I saved? Because I didn't want to go to hell. And, you know, some people might be ashamed of admitting that, but that was the pure reason why I was saved when I was 10 years old. I didn't want to go to hell. That was a pretty immature reason, but it was good enough. You know, my, my reasons for being a Christian are different and more mature now, but they still involve, I don't want to go to hell. And what you're saying is right. Um, why am I serving God for the reward? Because there's something in it for me. So I can be selfish in a self-centered kind of way, or I can be selfish in a Christ-centered kind of way. And Christ's ultimate sacrifice and death resulted in his glorification. So. Well, Jesus went to the cross, it says, for the joy set before him. Right? Mm -hmm. I think Jesus said it better than me. But I think he was trying to say the same thing. Oh, boy, the guy in my church who He's in his 90s. Said, why do you keep preaching sermons that make me have to think? <laughs> I don't know how we got off on that in First John, but there had to be a reason. I've been called dangerous, you can imagine. <laughs> I, need, I need Pastor Joe to straighten me out. <laughs> Just remind me of that. Preacher who said he golfs. He preaches the same way he golfs. Always to the right and near a hazard. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you're not going to tell Earl Rodmacher what I just said, are you? Oh, I got the tape. <laughs> <laughs> you can tell me yourself. Did you hear Earl listen to it? Okay, here we go. Uh, what verse are we on? Number eight. 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 You guys are doing remarkably well. Right. So Who wants to do it? Yeah, somebody do it. You're going to do it? Okay, who's going to do nine? You're going to do nine? Yeah, you'll do nine. You're going to do nine? I'll do ten. You'll do ten. I'll do one, no. <laughs> okay, let's go for it. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Very nice. All right. Yeah, there's another way of saying that. Truth, uh, ourselves we are leading astray. You know, ourselves we lead astray. Uh, That's a little bit odd in English, but yeah. Yeah. Now this word, this is an interesting word, planao. Um, John, right? Can you tell me what tense that word is, um, as it is in the text, planomen? That's conjunctive. Uh, well, tense. Okay, it's a present tense. Right? Um, I believe it's indicative. I'm, I'm, I'm putting myself out on a limb here in my own mind, you know, but I... I uh, if we say that we are not having sin, we are deceiving ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Now, why is it omen? See, now here, here's, here's a good example. I mean, we know that omen looks like a subjunctive oh. ending. But the, but the vocabulary is planao, alpha contract verb. Yeah. So I have an alpha plus an omicron equals what? Mm -hmm. Omega. So that's why we have an indicative here. But it could well be, um, actually, uh, it, it would be the same form if it were subjunctive. Uh, but context is telling me that it needs to be indicative. All right. Um, but the word planao is the word from which we get our word planet. Did you know that? Um, and you didn't know that? Have you ever um, have you ever seen pictures from Earth of the path of a planet in the sky? Um, who was it that was into the planets? Was that Galileo? Yeah. Or one of those guys? You know? Huh? Yeah. But if you see like from Earth, if you take a picture of the sky night after night, which tracks the path of a planet, 
um, the path is just is just all curly like this in the sky. You know why is that? Because we're we're twisting and moving around the sun, and that planet is moving around the sun. But so from the perspective of Earth, the planets wander in the sky, and this this wandering, not going down a straight path, is connected to the idea of being deceived. I don't know if it has to do with making your path straight or the opposite of that, but, um, but I mean, that's, that's where the meaning comes from. So, you know, being deceived kind of you know, is connected to the idea of wandering, not being you know, directed properly. Okay, good translation. This is very good. Who's doing the next verse? Okay. Mm-hmm. We acknowledge our sin that mm-hmm. is faithful and just uh, in order to uh, um, put away to, uh, to put away our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Okay, very good. Um, if we confess, now, the if here, um, we may or may not confess. I mean, that's a real contingency, right? <coughs> well, look at this word confess. It's pretty interesting to me. Uh, made of two words. Um, hama is the first part. Um, hamas, hama, and lageo. Now, lageo obviously means to speak, right? Um, hamas means what? The same. You have homogenized milk, right? Which means that it's the same all the way through instead of the cream rising to the top. You thought we used the other example, didn't you? Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> um, so what do you think hamalageo means? Okay, to say the same thing. Or you could say even agree. So, what does this mean to confess? Well, yeah, to speak the truth, but it really means to, to speak the same thing. But yeah, agree with. But agree with whom? God. Agree with God, right? Yeah. So we do something, God has a perspective on it, right? When we confess, we are taking God's perspective on our action. <coughs> so confessing isn't simply admitting. It's not, if we admit our sins, right? Okay, I did it. I did it. That's admitting. But when we take God's perspective on our sins, when we confess our sins, He, Jesus, um, He is faithful and just in order that, Hina, uh, with what mood, our faith? Uh, subjunctive. Okay, with the subjunctive, all right? Uh, in order that, he might forgive, right? Uh, we'll talk about that word in a moment. Um, so hina is introducing a result kind of use of the subjunctive. So the result of Jesus being faithful and just is that he would forgive. Now, what's he forgiving? Tos hamartias, that's in the accusative case, right? So it's the direct object. He might forgive the sins, and hey min is in the dative form. This actually is a, a dative of advantage, right? So he might forgive the sins for us. Now, you could make a pretty good argument here that toss the article is a possessive use of the article. He might forgive, I mean, there are sins, right? That he might forgive oh, our God. sins for us. Right? Or he might forgive our sins. You could argue that this is a dative of possession, I guess. But it's not unusual, this construction is not unusual, this word forgiveness. Forgive the sins for us. Forgive our sins for us, to our benefit. Right? Now this word forgive, this is, this is odd. This is an odd form. This is an aorist, active, subjunctive, third singular from afie me. We haven't had me verbs yet. You know, we had the omega conjugation that we've been learning so far. 
O S A Amenadagusi Sa 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 Sama Sa Re San. The Omega conjugation. <laughs> There's a B conjugation. Hope that doesn't depress you too much. Um, it's not as hard to deal with as the Omega conjugation by far. So you can relax. <laughs> but uh, anyway, Afiemi um, means to forgive or or to release. So you are you are released from your sins. In other words, you're not held accountable for your sins. Um, you know, Jesus says in the Gospels that if we do not forgive one another, then we can't expect God's forgiveness. So what does it mean when we forgive when we forgive one another? You think, yeah, let go of it. Do you think forgiving one another is different than how Jesus forgives us in this relational kind of sin? So, you know, when we forgive one another, is it a releasing a person of responsibility for those sins? Is it not holding them accountable anymore for those sins? So, I forgive you. And here's a good question. Uh, somebody, somebody borrows something from you and breaks it. Five times. And they say, will you forgive me? And they say, yes, I'll forgive you. Do you loan them something the sixth time? Well, you know, uh, would, would Jesus, if he's forgiven us, would Jesus give us the sixth, sixth yeah. chance? Or are we not forgiving like Jesus? And here's another thing. Um, if someone wrongs you and they don't ask forgiveness, they don't ask forgiveness, but they wronged you, should you forgive them anyway? Or are you required to forgive them anyway? Are you required to release them? Depends if you're limited to tell them or not. Um, <laughs> So your husband forgets your anniversary. That's right. Are you required to forgive him? If he does, if he if he says, if your husband says it's just not an important thing, get over it. Are you just required at that point to forgive him for thinking so little of your anniversary? There would be no forgiveness necessary because <laughs> you'd be dead. <laughs> no forgiveness possible. Well, I might challenge you to think because I kind of think that no, you are not required nor should you forgive a person who doesn't ask for forgiveness. Are we going to go beyond what God does? Because God does not forgive those who do not ask for forgiveness. He does in a way. You know, lack of forgiveness can eat you up, right? Yeah, yeah. I was just going to say, I mean, I think even just for our own sakes, we need to forgive people. I mean, people who we do we never even see again, and, you know, somehow wrong this. I, but I, th I, I think I like what you say. I think we confuse it. The Bible says, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord, I will repay. Yeah. So if we harbor something against someone in a vengeful kind of way, we're sinning, and that's really bad for us. But, but if we are holding someone accountable for their actions, now if we are all stressed out about it, again, I think there is a sense of releasing it to God. I really like that, what you said. But you know what? If your husband says, our anniversary is just not important, get over it. That's an issue in your relationship. Right. Do you, you need counsel? Do you want to, like, I guess have to think both that, we, you know, it's like you've forgiven for, you know, forgiving the anniversary, but then you still talk about But how you gonna, but how you gonna talk about the problem if he if he doesn't even admit that there's an issue? You can make someone talk. <laughs> you can get into a conversation with someone. But well, yeah. I'm just like I mean, with a child. If a child does something wrong, you can forgive them, but you still might need to punish them for it. I haven't so forgotten a single anniversary. 
that's a very good thing. Had one yet. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, don't because it's not a good thing. So, yes. I was gonna. I was gonna ask. Can you forgive, like between you and the Lord? Um, you know, say person X has offended me, and before the Lord, I've forgiven them, but that person and I have not reconciled. Would you say there's any difference between that? I think something like that. You know, you turn the issue over to the Lord. Well, what does David do in the Psalms? I mean, we look at the Psalms and go, oh, that was my Old Testament where they killed people. That can't be for now. You know, what did, I don't think the Psalms are so much not for today. What did, the imprecatory Psalms. Exactly. What did, if that camera were on, I'd tell you a story about the imprecatory Psalms. Um, I could tell what, you. I can off. Yeah. <laughs> what, did they, what, did, what did David do? Oh, did David have enemies in the Psalms? Couple. And did David just forgive his enemies, or what did he do? He, he turned them over to God and said, God, smash their teeth. Um, but there's also a reconciliation. Even in Romans 13, I mean, we quote that uh, passage from Isaiah. I think it's 13, it might be 12, where it's talking about, you know, if your enemies are hungry, feed them. If you thirst, feed them. If you're anxious, and so doing, you're keeping coals of fire on them. Well, yeah, but what did David do with um, Saul? What did he do with Saul when Saul was trying to kill him? David had more than one opportunity to kill Saul, and he didn't do it. Yeah, that's a whole other interpretive thing. What does heaping coals of fire on their head mean? Um, you know, David didn't actually lift a hand against God's anointed. He was king, so that's another thing. But, um, you know, I think that let me, let me tell you what made me think about this. Remember, there was, it's been some time ago, I think it was Paducah, Kentucky, where there was a group of kids praying in a circle. And one of their classmates came in with a gun and shot a bunch of them. Remarkably, uh, made all kinds of you know, accurate headshots with a handgun at some distance, which is very difficult to do, believe me. Um, and he, he was able to do that because he practiced so much on video games that gave him the skill to do that. Um, but he, he shot and killed some of those kids in that group praying. And the, 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 the boy who was actually leading that prayer group said uh, right away on the news, well, we forgive him. Now, was it appropriate for him to right away forgive that kid who shot? Not, that it was such, not because it was such a bad thing the kid did, but the kid had not asked forgiveness. And and I heard Jewish people recoiling that, that Christians really didn't understand the concept of forgiveness. And I think they're right. You know, God certainly doesn't just forgive because he wants to without the person seeking forgiveness. Should we just release someone of responsibility for their actions when they haven't sought that relief? When they haven't admitted what I did to you was wrong. Now, what does the scripture say? When someone offends you, what does scripture say to do? When someone offends you, you are supposed to what? Forgive them, or they want it or not? No. Go to that person and confront them, and your confrontation could lead to them being kicked out of the church if they what? Don't admit that they've done wrong. So I just wonder if we really, as Christians, do properly understand forgiveness and its relationship to vengeance, and, and certainly if you harbor bitterness you know, and vengeance in your heart to somebody, that'll eat you up and you can't do that. But is that the same as saying, you know, it's okay, you're not responsible for what you did. You don't, I, I don't care. In a sense, you're saying, I don't care if you come to a point of realizing that you did wrong. Wasn't that the issue? I mean, isn't that why there's, one, there's a difference between us going to God and, and between God and we're not going to hold it against this person. But just like, like in the math class, when you do it, when it does say go to confront, you know, and then take people and then if they decide not to, he says treat them like an unbeliever. I think how do I treat unbelievers? Right. I would love them. Right. Yeah. Well, you still love them and you yeah, try to evangelize them. them. Yeah, exactly. But you don't have the same fellowship with them. And what supports what you're saying is what did Jesus say on the cross? Yeah. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. So you gotta, you know, you gotta put that in the whole mix as well. I think of like uh, the, the believer's context and relationship with God. Uh, we're forgiven, but there's, that doesn't mean we're uh, never going to be held accountable for something we do. Like in First Corinthians 3, when it talks about 
Well, check this out. This verse says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just in order that he might forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. <coughs> this brings up another issue. I thought we were already forgiven of our sins as Christians. Now, when you got saved, the day you got saved, and I'm making an assumption that all of us are saved here. I think that's probably a pretty fair assumption. Um, the day you got saved, were you not forgiven of your sins? And were you not forgiven of your sins, past, present, and future? Is that not true? And how is it that he can say, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all our sins? In the context of relationship, we're talking about fellowship here. Yeah, the whole thing so, about John is about fellowship. So, yeah, in the context of fellowship. All right. All right, it's about fellowship, where when we're saved, we're forgiven in what sense? Position. Position. Position, what does that mean? Like, uh, maybe legally. Okay, legally, we're justified. That's a legal term. We are justified in Christ, so we are forgiven legally, positionally, and probably relationally at that point, too. But then we can mess it up, right? All right, so this is talking about more um, relational issues of forgiveness or lack of, of the same, and not legal issues. Um, we, are, we are properly related to God as sons, as Galatians says, but that doesn't mean we don't need forgiveness in a relational sense. Yes? Could this be a cause? Like one of those causes is that if you've done this and you have, then this is the outcome? No. No, this is... How, this how is, do we know grammatically? Because this is on with the subjunctive, which means... Oh, yeah. Which means it is a, uh, a conditional sentence that. And then um, a, the epsilon yoda, would be the other one. Yeah, that would be since. Since this. Okay. And then there's the other one, you know. If, if this were true, but it's not. <laughs> well, that's not what we have here either. We have another one. Right? This. We have an addition of the gospel to it because it's not a bad conditional forgiver. Yeah, that's right. All right, there's another thing in this verse. If we confess. Our sins, that is, if we, if we look at our sins from God's perspective, uh, He is faithful and just in order that He might forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So if we confess our sins, we're going to be cleansed. Now, this can't be positionally, right? Because of the discussion we just had. It's going to be relationally and practically, isn't it? Right? <coughs> so if we confess our sins, He is going to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. What does that mean? It means we're not going to sin like that anymore? Maybe after time. But continually. What if you confess a sin and do it again right away? Did you really confess it? Remember, it's not admitting it. It's doing what? It's, a, it's looking at it from God's perspective. It's agreeing with God. So maybe if we are looking at it from God's perspective, we're going to have a tendency not to do that. Well, but when we're not yeah, looking at I, it from God's perspective. Yeah, me either. Cause, cause well, he said, said, like, I mean, he, he agreed that sin was wrong. He agreed with, with God about it, yet he was still, he didn't understand he was how wrong. He was, he was deceived but wrong. Uh, in other ways, not, right. not in understanding that it was wrong for you know, God. People are complex, right? Mm -hmm. uh, we, can, we can be saved people and still accomplish great evil, can't we? And, but we can even des be saved people desiring to do good, you know, loving the law of God, and still be evil. Evil. But, but can't we, because we, we know the sin is wrong. Mm -hmm. But where are we living? See? Are we living in that space <coughs> within our being, right? I mean, we can't at the same time know something is wrong and not be looking at it from God's perspective. I think. Because if you ask me, okay, if you ask me, is that wrong? Well, yeah. Well, why are you doing it? 
because I'm walking according to the flesh, which means that where's my perspective at that point? I'm not defined by God, but the flesh, right? Yeah, but, but in, in regard to the perspective on the sin, is, is, is a, we're saying no. Yeah, and right. he, he said he delights in the law of God according to the inward man. You know, and he, he, he loved the law of God. He, he hated the and that's sin right. that he was doing. And, what, and the inward man is the sanctified part of this. Right. And but the flesh is the unsanctified part of it. So does that does that sanctified part of us go away because I am operating in the flesh? No, that, that's kind of my point. Is that we can we can have, I mean, we can have God's perspective on, on and be sin. and be in the Spirit, you know, filled with the Spirit at one moment, and the very next moment we could be walking according to the flesh and doing the exact same thing that we were doing. Agreed, but. We're not operating from God's perspective at that point. At that point, but that's but that's not you know two seconds ago or whatever. Right, but I, I can still know God's perspective. Yeah. And I, I think this is where faith is more than just knowing. Again, we kind of had that discussion. Mm -hmm. You know, faith involves more than just knowing. Faith is what I'm trusting. If I'm trusting the flesh, now I'm looking. I'm coming from a different perspective as opposed to trusting the Spirit. I have to confess that I don't have all the answers to these things, but they're great questions, aren't they? Um, yeah, is the other unrighteousness, all the other unrighteousness, related to the sins that we have specifically confessed? Or yeah. are there the blotches of other sins that we haven't even thought of, but at that time... Well, they're probably intertwined, I suppose. You know, I mean, once, once we... Once we get a hold of God's perspective on stealing, if I'm stealing dumb, you know, and I'm walking in that perspective and all of that, um, it'll probably help me not to steal, you know, Tic Tacs, um, I suppose. But that's a good point um, on the word all at the end of that. C uh, cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Um, sometimes you hear preachers say, you know, when the Bible says all, that means all, as, as if to say, I hope nobody's ever said that, because I don't mean to be offensive, but um, as if to say that all is always, would you look at Joe? Would you say that? I don't know. I'm not saying that. All means all. Yeah. All right, I'm sorry. All does mean all. But all doesn't always mean all. All is very rarely absolute in its use. Very rarely. All means all in its context. All, all, all is almost always limited by its context, and it is here. I would say that all here is limited by the context of the sins we confess. He's going to cleanse us of all of those. And it's kind of like this. Now, sometimes all is, is used in an absolute sense. Like when you say God has created all things. Okay, there's, that's pretty absolute. Right? Because there's nothing that's created. Although even that's not absolute because God didn't create God. You know? but, but anyway. But, but the question is not, that's not the question here. Because he says he's going to forgive us the sins. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us the sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. What is that? And tell me how the word all is limited there. Right. Well, in this context, it's singular, so you really could translate it every unrighteousness. Whether that makes any okay. difference. Whether okay. that makes any difference, sure. I don't think so. Okay. But um, I think in the context, it's, it's limited by... Um, It's limited by what we confess. I mean, I think, I think. Well, you've got to be careful, you know. But it seems to me reason tells us that if I confess one sin, now I'm not. I mean, like, and we're not trying to theologize based on experience, really. But is it really true that? I mean, does it ring true that if I confess even one sin, then I'm now cleansed of all unrighteousness? Well, it seems you have to confess. Well, well, let me ask you this question: If if I don't, if there are other sins there and I don't confess them, then am I still out of fellowship with God until I have confessed every sin by well, you? Well, I mean, this way: if you're if you're you know living in adultery and, and uh, you know you uh, uh, gave someone a middle finger when you cut you off, you know, and you go. I don't know if like that's what we take care of the problem. I mean, I'm not sure. You have to 
confess your known sins. And I think that's the issue. Because I mean, because the idea of confess is that is that we're um, we're coming to the, the same perspective as God, I guess. We're acknowledging we're not sin to sin as sin. And, and also in the context we're looking at and saying that there's no darkness whatsoever in God. And um, I think I think we have to confess our known sins. But I I think if you if you, you can't say that that not confessing unknown sins Well, here, here's the deal. I'd, I'd like to get away from the idea of enumerating particular acts of sin here. Now, i got to be careful because it is sins, plural. But I, I think to take God's perspective on my sins is not about enumerating to God, okay, I sin here, I sin there. Because, I mean, think of the practicality of that, too. I mean, how do we, if we sin so much, how do we even possibly keep track of our sins? You know, well, God will bring them to your memory. Well, I don't think so. I don't think we'll even remember all of our sins. But if I can gain God's perspective on my impatience with my children, that is going to change how I operate. And I don't necessarily have to go back and remember every time I've been impatient with my children. And I, I think even if I went to my kids and confessed that, and if I said to them, which I have, you know, I tend to be impatient with you in these contexts or whatever. I don't think my kids required me to go back and say, yeah, well, for the last, you know, I'm, I've been alive 12 years and I remember, you know, uh, nine of those. And these are the times when you've been impatient with me. I don't think they care about that. I think if they, they know that I understand that I have a tendency to be impatient with them, that goes a long ways with them. And it goes a long way with me changing my behavior. You see what I mean? So I don't think it's about enumerating um, you know, specific acts of sin in entirely and in getting all of them. I think it is understanding specific acts are sin and taking God's perspective on those. Does that make sense? But also, um, I'm, I'm looking at a couple of uh, lexicons here for on the Hamalaga. Uh, Well, you'll see a definition confess. Right, I, I see, I mean, to say say the same thing to another, to agree with sin, to see, not to refuse, um, to promise, not to deny, to confess, to declare. Well, I'm surprised that it goes confess, as far uh, as it does. Well, it says that you're finding agree with? Um, yeah, well, a sin. Yeah, to agree with is sin. But that, I don't see anything that's saying that, that we have to to the exact same perspective that, that God has. But just well, that I think that's just another way of saying agree with, isn't it? Well, to give assent to, to agree with, to say the same thing as, who are you confessing? To confess. Um, right. In English, we tend to look at confess as just, okay, I did it. I'm just suggesting that this is more than, okay, I did it. It's a change of, it's a change of mindset, it's a change of perspective. But would that not be to agree with someone if someone says, you sin? Yeah, yeah it, it is, but it's 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 not only it's not only agreeing this is sin, but agreeing something about the nature of that as sin and the consequences of it. And but in, the con in other words, if I'm agreeing with somebody, but in the context of this, isn't it just that, isn't it just talking about like not saying that we we don't have sin? I mean, it shouldn't be just the opposite. Like well, let's say, let's, let's say that because of the plural, it's saying, okay, I'm saying, I'm not going to say I don't have sin, but I'm also going to confess my sins, right. plural. Right. Um, and and we we're talking about the Word of God. I'm, am I not trying, by reading the Word of God, to adopt God's perspective on things? Mm -hmm. and I'm, I'm, I'm saying, I, I, I'm not disagreeing with right. you there. I just, I, I don't. I, I think I am reading in a little bit, um, at least, other teachings of Scripture. Mm -hmm. You know, like Romans 12, uh, first couple verses. Um, uh, do, 
not be. I, I can think of an English translation, do not be conformed to this world, but the word world there is not cosmos, it's age. Um, do not be conformed to this age. In other words, don't allow your mindset to be limited to this time frame. Take an eternal perspective. And so, you know, as a Christian, I'm trying to gain God's perspective on life. And so I'm reading that into that. I, I don't grant you that. But I don't think I'm violating very much the concept of agree with, um, let's give assent to, uh, say the same thing. I mean, I, I can, to, to me it's not just, it's not just um, spouting words, say the same thing as, but I'm saying the same thing because I see it like God sees it. Right, I just, I, I don't know, I just would, I don't know. It seems like if, if we push it too far though, we're putting stipulations on it that John isn't, at least, at, at least isn't making clear. You know, that, I mean, well, I guess I, in a sense I kind of wonder why I can admit my sin and it doesn't change my behavior. But you think that he would say something about that? That's what he was meaning, right? I mean, well, has he? No, we're, well, we're, we're discussing is not the same as repentance. Yeah, my my idea here is that that that, that John's actually <laughs> is it? talking about it from a, a well, is confession way. the same thing as repentance? I don't think so. But no, you know, I'm, I'm kind of thinking this is just another word to describe maybe another side of the same coin. I mean, is confession really all that different from repentance? What does the word repent mean? Change your mind. Now, this is not this is not focusing on the mental. This is focusing on, you know, the verbal. I don't know if you literally have to say it out loud, right? But is this just using, you know, verbal kind of language to describe the same thing that repentance describes in mental kind of language? I don't know. I kind of think so. It's becoming aware of yourself from a different perspective. But you know, I really do appreciate what you're saying about if, if we're really going to be serious about what John is saying, and that has to be our starting place, let's not import too much here. Right. And I, I really take that as a very positive uh, admonition. And I, 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 I agree so and take the same perspective. <laughs> <laughs> Cyrus now. All right. If we say, what, what, by the way, what tense is apomen? Yeah, I'm making that mean. Yeah. All right. What tense is apomen? Cyrus or apomen? Second word. It's active. Second. Eris. It's eris. Okay. So if we say, now it's eris, but doesn't mean it's in the past, it's potential, right? But it's it's not dirt. If it's if we if just if we say it's simple. If we say that now this is indirect discourse, isn't it? There are no quotes here. But if we say that um, we have not sinned, what tense is a marte come in? Future. Nope. Perfect. Okay. If we say that we have not sinned, go ahead. Future activity. What's future? Uh, where have we moved on? Yeah, just keep translating. If we say that we have not sinned, um, a liar, we are making him. Very good. We are making him a liar. And his word is not in us. His word is not in us. Very good. Very good. Well, it's pretty exciting. I'm not really sure that you know, you, you, you have um, more unanswered questions because you can read Greek. You probably, you, you, or less unanswered. You have probably have you probably have more unanswered questions because you can read Greek than if you didn't read Greek. But at least you can ask better questions, right? Yeah. And asking questions is the key to good exegesis, isn't it? Asking the right questions. Um, I think it's awesome. I don't really need to do Every time, like, every lesson is just like, man, it's getting better and better and better. Yeah, it just, it's, you know, it's just better. It's funny.
funny to me because every time we every time we read, we have a whole gob of things we just dealt with in class, like indirect discourse and on with the subjunctive. The reason this is so weird to me is normally if I if I'm teaching a beginning Greek class, um, we've probably been in First John second week. Uh, we'd be halfway through the book now. Um, you know, that's almost the first thing you're going to do is get into your Bible, just because it's motivation. So normally we're like, we're, we would have done 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, and we'd be halfway through 1st John by now, and you'd be having quizzes by now. You, you'd have been long having quizzes on translation and parsing out of 1st John. I, I, you'd come in and I'd say, okay, I want you to translate for me, not this early in the book, because we'd have started it a lot earlier. Um, but I you know, translate verse 2 and parse this and that for me. So I've never taught people this far along, and then this far back in the beginning of first job, so it's kind of interesting. So you know more now than any students I have ever taught at this point in first job, which is kind of cool. You guys are animals. I can't believe how well you're translating. I mean, it's almost like you're reading an English translation uh, or something. Uh, so that's just really awesome. So next week we'll resume. Yeah, I guess. Is your password still the same? Well, if you haven't given it to me, go ahead. Um, yes. Yeah, give me your translation work on in John. All right. So next time you know what the quiz is going to cover, right? You know what the quiz is going to cover um, vocabulary, subjunctive endings. And the next week, your quiz will include translation from first John. And what you want us to translate? Oh, very good point. Thank you. That would have been a disaster if I hadn't told you that. I would like you to translate in chapter 2. Uh, I would like you to, if you can get through verse 14, that'd be awesome, but at least get through verse 11. Now, that's why you have such light homework from your grammar, right? You almost have, you almost have no homework by comparison from your grammar. But spend the time doing the first 11 verses of chapter 2 of 1 John. First 11? See, when I, uh, I used to work for Grace Mandela, and I had to edit uh, St. Hodge's commentary on the Epistles of John. Did you really? So, like, all of his translation things, like, it's really hard not to just, like, you know, I don't know. How dare you study? That's pretty cool.